A Pear Tree to Remember by Esther Marie Clay Osborne. Goodbye. I'm leaving New York, said Bevy. As she looks down at her phone, she sees her brother testing calling, only to silence it. Hey, you can't just leave like that, said Richard, Bevy's fiancé. I'm out of here, said Bevy. Come on, Betty Boo Bear, said Richard. Just give me one more chance. The minute the stock goes up for the company, I promise, I'll mention you to everyone, anyone I know. It's been three years since we left grad school. And for the last two years, I've just been your, what's that annoying name you call me? Right, your petty boo assistant, said Bevy. I did all the hard work so I can become CEO. And you down me every time in front of the whole marketing team. <sighs> Everyone still loves you, Bevy said Richard. How? said Bevy. You're constantly taking all of my proposals and putting yourself out there as the hero they love. And when things go wrong, you blame me for the mistakes you've made in front of everyone, only for me to look like the fool. I'm going to enjoy seeing Wall Street tear you to pieces when they find out you're a fraud, Bevy said. Richard walks up to Bevy saying, We can just talk about this, right? You need me. Before I needed you, Richard, said Bevy. But never again. What are you talking about? He says. As Bevy goes down the elevator and out the door, Richard, gravely embarrassed, screams out of his Manhattan penthouse window, saying, What are you going to do without me, huh? What are you going to do without me? Bevy incredulously walks down the street at a slow, bewildered pace with her stilettos tightly on her bags tightly packed, and her heart loosely on her shoulders. Weeks pass, and just as Bevy's expensive hotel bill arrives to her doorstep, Tustin, her brother, calls. She looks down and arrogantly picks up the phone. Let me guess says Bevy. You've never called so frequently. In one month? Are you calling on behalf of mom and dad? Gosh, they're pestering dreams of me coming back home to that stupid pear business that I'd wish they abolished years ago. How could you put up with it? Dad, Cared more about those pear trees? More than my education. More than his own children. More than anything, said Bevy. We had a deal with being the laugh of the town. Everyone claiming our family will never amount to anything. Selling pears made our whole childhood ruin. Every last one of our friends and their parents Stop talking to us, because we had no time to play. We just grew pear trees. If only our parents had no more jobs like the others in the fish business or boating business, restaurant chain, hotel business, tourism, or sold one of the million of other delicious yummy fruit that naturally just grew on the island and were popular. Bevy's great-grandfather was a traveling trader worldwide. One hot day, 
he tasted the best pears in China. They smelled beautifully and quenched his thirst. He then brings the pear seeds home, only to notice he only has one seed left. Due to a storm he encountered on the ship, tossing his valuables around. Still very determined, Bevy's grandfather tried to plant the pear tree in their island soil. Miraculously, more than one pear tree grew. His big success started a joyful bonding family tradition in the pear business. Even though pears weren't popular or even native to their land. Bevy's dad held the memories dearly to his heart, only to dream of filling their island with that sweet aroma and unforgettable thirst-quenching nectar, having fields of pear trees everywhere. When Bevy was a child, things didn't turn out as Bevy's dad dreamed. Business was slow in their small town, Bevy was always embarrassed because their dad literally struggled to have cars, TVs, clothes, and other things that normal families had, causing the family to be in debt. After taking out large loans, he would have large amounts of land and farming equipment for all of the pear trees, but not much for his children. Bevy knew her skills in business and financing, envying the upper class. When she was older, Bevy was ready to leave home for a better life. She always tried offering advice on how her dad can capitalize and make more money by venturing throughout the island more, doing internet sales, getting creative, and having more exposure making websites, marketing himself better, but he was always so old school. Telling his daughter to stay in her place and be his little girl. They could really talk business all day, but when he would put her in that box, they bumped heads. Later on realizing in life, it was a box almost everybody she had gotten close with tended to put her in. Richard was a perfect example. Bevy's dad believed it was his job to do all of the work, only for the family to be looked at as poor and crazy. But Mama was always loved and always shared lots of faith and joy of nature, God, and all good things but it was hard for them to connect. Bevy was passionate about life. Her parents thought she would never leave home, but she did. It broke Bevy's dad's heart, and it broke Bevy's heart too. He wasn't even proud of his daughter getting a scholarship to one of the biggest Ivy League schools in America, Cornell. University, the one thing that made their family look somewhat decent or substantial, he despised. Going to school in the States was Bevy's way out. Bevy's mom's heart was a little broken too, but she never showed it or said it. Her wanting Bevy to have kids and a husband and to pass the business down to her children was the goal. But seeing her daughter live bold and brave outside of this poor life brought inspiration beyond understanding and secretly was an answer prayer. Although Bevy's mother would never say it aloud, that was their disconnect. Heston, Bevy's brother, became the only family communicated with in the years. Teston now 
spoke calmly as he could contain, genuinely asking how Bevy was doing. He instantly, giving a bit of hope and tranquility to the situation at hand, eased her mind. They talked for hours. Bevy, now asking Tustin, how is he holding up? Tustin answers with a begging of her to just come home. That it will only be good for her to get away from the city for a bit. Tessin's voice in desperation. Please, Bevy, come home. It is now dawn the next day, and Tessin, with tears of joy, picks up Bevy from Paraco International Airport of Trinidad and Tobago. Tessin driving as they enter Port of Spain City, heads to Maracas Beach. Bevy breathes in deeply, smelling the fresh island air. <sighs> I can't believe I'm home. You're home, says Tustin. As they drive through the small town, seeing Bevy, they stop the vehicle as people give their condolences for Bevy's dad. What's going on? Says Bevy. Tessin explains to Bevy that in the last couple years, their dad actually took Bevy's marketing advice. People loved his pears. It was like he was passionate about the business all over again. He grew more seeds and there were thousands of pear trees everywhere. Interest rates, sales, produce were all skyrocketing. Business was going good for a while. The family was able to upgrade and have the home and life Bevy's dad always wanted to give them. He decided to create a whole room slash office with all of her favorite things and mostly her ideas he never listened to, sending pictures and letters of how they're waiting for her to come visit. Until one day, all the pear trees rotted and died. No one knows why or how, but that's when Bevy's dad's heart became very ill. He's now in the hospital due to a serious heart condition. People say Bevy's mother might not even make it. As joyful as she can be, she hasn't been herself. That she might be next on the deathbed from all the stress of holding on to Bevy's dad. Dad had no choice but to leave everything up to me. Bankers have been calling like crazy, said Tustin. It's the land. We're in so much debt. I've been working overtime. A few of my friends and some nearby farmers keep concluding we should gamble the land. I told them, I can't do that, not without consulting dad. But they say there's a lot of money involved. And if I go to the right people, the land could be millions, but it's a huge risk. It's getting really dangerous. Huge resort companies and people from other islands around know about the land. Everybody wants in. They're all waiting on dad dying, me failing, and you, the lost daughter, never returning. Bevy, hearing all of this knew she had to finally admit that if it wasn't for her dad and all of his craziness, she would have never had a passion for business and sales. The pear trees, her dad, the island, her family was all that mattered. Bevy was done forgetting who she was. Some of her greatest memories, her only memories of childhood, were surrounded around that pear tree. Despite all the defeat and pain. Take me to the hospital, Bevy says, demanding Tustin and Hayes to go to their parents. 
Arriving, Bevy's mother grips Bevy to her chest with a large kiss, beginning to weep of how much Bevy's loved. That she's truly proud of her daughter. Bevy chats with her mother a bit, then having a sense of clarity, she connects deeply with her mother. Where is he? Where's dad? Let me take you to him, says Bevy's mom. Bevy thinks of all the good and bad, becoming overwhelmed and filled with agony. She remembers how cold her heart was towards her dad. Her heart! Instantly, Bevy remembers the pear tree. Testin, Bevy said, do you remember the heart mountain? Yes, said Testin. Dad used to take us camping there. We had sold so many pears on the side of that little road. And, and every time we went, people wanted us to come back early the next morning. Dad would be so happy. The money was good. We'd get a break. He'd let us run off and play in the glowing moonlight lagoon. He'd teach us to fish and make fires. It was the best. Why? said Tessin. Let's go. Right now, Tessin said. Tell Dad we'll be back, Mom, Bevy said. About an hour later, after they've hiked through Heart Mountain, it was getting dark. They reached the heart of Heart Mountain, where the moonlight lagoon was a soft blue light glowing in the distance. The land, the trees, and everything was still beautiful, more than ever. Follow me, says Bevy, as they walk on the side of the wall mountain and trees like they used to when they were kids. They come to a shocking stop. There at the entrance of the lagoon area was the pear tree, stronger than ever, making the sweetest aroma of nectar they have ever smelled with hundreds of the biggest, ripest, juiciest pears you could ever see. Walking deeper towards the lagoon, the whole area radiated the purest glowing light, showing a large surrounding thick forest full of blossoming pear trees everywhere. My pear tree, Bevy said. You want to hear something crazy? I never believed Grandpa's story of his one pear seed. Except for now, said Bevy. You want to hear something else crazy? Sure, said Teston. The first business I ever wanted to run was the pear business. So every time I would eat a pear seed or see Dad drop pear seeds, I'll take all of them and come to the spot where we camp. And while you guys were asleep, I'd come up with my own ways of planting the pear trees and growing them. But none of the seeds would grow. I literally, in my head, thought I could come up here and get all these pears one day, then beat Dad at selling all of them. Then one night, I went into Dad's seating bag and took one pear seed and came here by the glowing lagoon. <laughs> said Tustin. Wow, look at all these pears. They're everything that Dad dreamed of. The smell, the fullness of them, everything. They're untouchable. No one comes up here. Right, sing Bevy. No one knows how great the soil is in this lagoon. 
and how much water feeds all of these beautiful plants. There's enough pears to last a lifetime. And I try to tell dad that this land he has down there is going to give out. That we should use it to create stocking areas and a store. Being so close to the ocean and all the salt water and erosions, it isn't the best place. I always told him we should go higher into the hills. He wouldn't listen to me, mostly due to fear of expansion and growth, said Bevy. Crunch, crunch, slurp, test in eating the pears. So delicious. They're spectacular. Try one. Bevy's eyes trying to hold back tears as she remembers her dad and the painful, frustrating thought of never eating a pear with him again, let alone doing anything with him again. Meanwhile, a phone call comes in from Bevy's mom. Your, your, your dad's brain and heart just got attacked. He's in a coma, Bevy's mom said. They immediately head back to the hospital, taken over by the darkest emptiness they've ever felt. Tustin and Bevy bringing the pairs along with them with screenshots and video footage to show their dad. Tustin says, what good will this do? Bevy, he's not going to make it. Just shut up and drive. Have some faith, will you? You didn't even believe I was going to be in this country. At this time, you've been begging for me for years to come back home. So have faith for dad now. Both Tustin and Bevy back at the hospital, holding in the remorse and extreme tears go to their dad. Bevy pauses in the hall as she gets ready to enter into her dad's hospital room. Then, their eyes locked from the room door as Bevy's dad captures one last glimpse of his daughter, Bevy, before he dies. Beep, goes Bevy's dad's pulse. Doctor? Doctor! Someone get a doctor! Screams Bevy's mom. Running into the room, Bevy says, Everybody, everybody out, please. While his body's still warm, I just want him to hear my voice. Just give me a minute with my dad alone. Shaking rapidly, she begins to tell her dad about Heart Mountain and childhood. Bevy opens the bag of pears and the sweet aroma fills the room. Calling her brother and mother into the room to join her in eating one last pear with her dad, she says. I remember my happiest memories with you was eating sweet harvest of pears. It will turn the most disappointing and bitter day into the most accomplished and sweetest day. I realize why I was never happy doing anything else. This was my calling, to be your daughter, to be free, and to grow and prosper like the pear trees just as they bite into the pear. Beep, beep, beep. Bevy's dad's pulse comes back. 
He's breathing. Bevy's eyes couldn't believe it. Was he really alive? Bevy's mother burst into laughter, saying, God, thank you for bringing him back to me. Testing, holding for dear life of his dad's hand, giving a smile so strengthening. And now, Bevy's dad's eyes open as he slowly speaks, saying, Before I died, seeing you was an answer prayer, Bevy. I thought I'd never see you again. If... I could go back and do it all over. I would. Bevy now crying, saying, No, it was all worth it. Bevy showed her dad the pear tree as he said, I knew I smelled something so sweet. Moments later, Tustin and Bevy's mother walk over with more freshly washed cut pears, giving them out to nurses and doctors and people around. Tustin sang to them, I don't think you guys have ever tasted a pear so good. People being filled with instant joy. Wow, so sweet. Bevy's mother shares, all this business of pears. I don't think any of us have had pears in years. We stopped eating them a long time ago. As they all filled up, especially Bevy's dad, with some form of joy and strength, her dad, trying to speak once again, says, I remember watching you over and over. Bevy, you would fail <coughs> your goal of planting trees. <coughs> then one night, a little over ten years back, you thought I was asleep. And as we camped, you went far this time out to the lagoon, so I followed you. And I didn't want you to be disappointed again or get your hopes up. So I stopped taking you both to Heart Mountain. I've watched you over time, said Bevy's dad. Obtained skills, me <coughs> and your grandfather wish we had. I was so sure and you were going to convince me to let you run the business with all that planting and studying you were doing. But you left to New York. <coughs> so after reading your notes you left behind, I acted on it only to learn your ways and realize your Amazing, Bevy. I had missed you so much. I went back to Hard Mountain and saw your pear tree grew. I tried calling you, but you didn't pick up. I knew you needed space and time, said Bevy's dad. Bevy sat, saying to her dad, I hated you for so long because I forgot myself. But now I can only say thank you for remembering. How could I forget? said Bevy's dad. It was a pear tree to remember. The end. Thank you for listening to A Pear Tree to Remember by Estar Marie Clay Osborne. 
I really hope you guys enjoyed. And I want to give a shout out to Vocal Plus for publishing my short story. God bless.